paved with technology and rockets alone. It's built on the dreams, risk, and relentless spirit of those who dare look up and say, we belong there. For over 30 years, the Space Frontier Foundation has been a home for these visionary, radical, action-oriented individuals. Hear their stories, learn how space was shaped, and revel in the revolution of commercial space pioneers. Bob Werb, co-founder of the Space Frontier Foundation. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me and by extension, all the space enthusiasts that will be at, at some point watching this discussion. Uh, for folks that don't know Bob already, he was one of the visionaries that got this whole Space Frontier Foundation started. And Bob, the questions that I wanna kinda, the stories that I wanna draw out of you is what was your experience like how did you come up with making some of the decisions that you did way back in the 80s what were what was life like for you and how did you make the decisions to to kind of push space forward as much as you did so if if you'd like you can share some of your background but you don't have to <laughs> <laughs> i'll share very limited about my background i retired for the first time when i was a little over 30 and i went seven with my wife and my and we did that for about a year. When I decided to go back to the real world, I had been a real estate developer doing shopping centers, office buildings, suburban garden apartments, and I made enough money to retire early. But I decided so you were in, you were in the other space. Yes, you, you were, when people space. say space industry. A lot of times people think renting space, but you were in that space I was industry. In both, both space industries, and I and before that, I had helped start the new GTL fives and the after the Space Studies Institute. I was certainly aware of the problems. And I went and interviewed for a job at the NSS and came down to the final two people, Lori Garber or I. A gentleman named Charlie Walker definitely chose the right person and chose Lori. Because <laughs> he worked for McDonald Douglas and I was probably dangerous to their interests. I really wanted to do something about space. And of course, I already knew Rick and Jim and, and many other people in the community. We decided we needed to create another organization. That trying to fix the organizations that we had and that were for different purposes didn't make much sense, we should start a new one. I agreed to spend every Wednesday sitting in an office on the Intrepid, which is an aircraft carrier in New York Harbor. And we had a, a really nice office, no windows, below decks. But they gave us a nice free office, it, you know, buried in the, in the bowels of the ship. And it was quiet and it was a phone. And I took my route both through limited contact list and Jim and Rick's more extensive contact list. And I called up everybody on the list and asked them what they thought. And, and everybody had pretty much the same analysis, which is that we weren't, you know, that we were going nowhere fast. And we did a, we brought a bunch of people together in, in, on, the, on board the Intrepid. We, we actually used a room which hadn't been used since the 1940s, which last used for briefing pilots. And when I asked for a room right. to have a meeting in, they said, if you clean that room, you can use it. So <laughs> Rick found some volunteers who came in and cleaned the room. After that, we created the foundation. All this was in 1988. We didn't word it this way at the time, but the goal of changing the conversation about space. Um, so let me ask, first of all, let me later, ask, but that was the goal. If you haven't read Laurie's book, I I'm sure you probably have, but yeah, yeah. You were both up for that NSS job. Yes. And she had worked in the organization from kind of come up from it. What were you, so you had your business real estate career and then you came into and you were offering your leadership to the organization what was it you were hanging your application or your resume on at that point i just applied for the job i was they advertised for the job and i applied as to happen i knew many of the people that were on the search committee or at least they knew through your L, through l5 experience through l5 and somewhat through ssi as well i had actually been more active in space studies than five because i lived in new jersey i lived in skyway not okay. far from there and, so I was more involved there. And I think Lori was clearly the safer choice and, 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 and it worked out well because you know, I went off to do other things. It worked out well for me too, because I went back to sure. the business and continued to uh, do real estate for you know, another 20 years. What would you have, just out of curiosity, so you already said Lori was the better choice. If she hadn't taken the job, what do you think, how is your philosophy about space? And again, I'm asking you about an interview you had several years ago. Many what, years ago. Do you have an idea of what your kind of mind space was? 
I had a very open mind at the time. Of course, I, you know, I came out of the business world, so I, I naturally had that sort of orientation. The organization had very significant financial problems at the time, and a lot of the interviewing was about that and how you deal with that. Ultimately, the decision was made to deal with that by bringing a lot of money from the aerospace community, which I would not have done because I didn't have those skills. I would have sought money from other types of sources. I, you know, I had no idea whether it worked or not. It was, but it was clearly the risky approach. How many other business minds did you feel like were in the the general pool of these different organizations like if you present yourself as the guy with who's the entrepreneur and the business guy how many of your counterparts were scientists and engineers or defined themselves that way versus people that were looking at a business lens or using a business lens what's interesting is that all of us including the artists and lawyers and business types are all people who are very comfortable with the language of math, science, and engineering. And my background's in business, my undergraduate degree was in biology. And some very skilled people, teachers, tried to teach me to be a scientist. Failure was because they were dealing with bad raw material, <laughs> not, not, not because of who they were teaching. <laughs> Clearly, I wasn't destined to be a scientist. I was in grad school before I realized that, but it was not my destiny. And I think that remains a problem to this day, is that we all come from that sort of orientation. You know, even when you work with the artists we work with, there were people who are very comfortable with that language. There were a few other folks who had a business background who were around, but mostly there were people with engineering overwhelmingly dominates. Of course, Jim, Rick, and I were intentionally not engineers. I mean, it was a decision made for the three of us to not be engineers. And this is phenomenal. I did not have that piece that you had been like in that consideration. So that's that's really interesting. And I think your observation that the right sort of pairing seems to have worked out. So before you get to the intrepid, right? Before Muncie and Tumlinson convince you to give up your Wednesdays, <laughs> uh, are you? Where was that relative to this first retirement? Was that okay? When I came back, okay. you know, within weeks after I came back. I was talking to Jim and Rick and trying to figure okay. out what to do. So there's a younger Bob. He has less hair somehow. Actually, I had short hair at the time. I had a crook hair. Most people, you say it goes the other way around. Right. I had more hair back then. You actually have more hair now. How did that Bob interact with family and friends that weren't believers in space? Were you, were you the guy at the cocktail party that was always talking about space stuff? How did you interact with the non-space people at that time, if you can recall? By the time we started the foundation, I'd mostly given up on talking to people about studies. They really didn't want to hear what I had to say. They came to it with all sorts of bad biases. And I knew that what I was doing wasn't working, and I didn't yet know how to talk. It took me many years to figure out how to talk to the non-technological but educated people. And I think that's the biggest challenge in front of us now, is how to speak to that, that group of people. So it was space as a dirty secret, maybe, or, I mean, and by the way, you are, I think, correct. That is still a, ch a challenge. How did it make you feel? I hate to go to the, how did it make you feel, but how did it make? I was very angry. Angry. I know it's angry hard to imagine, end. but I really was an angry young man. <laughs> I was very angry, and I had to try, I was constantly repressing the anger. Was that anger at? A universe that was heading down the wrong path or is that anger at systems or just anger at something else well, at anger of what's faith at, at, at what we're doing in space or not doing in space by the 1980s Apollo had worn off mm. and civil space had become almost completely driven by poor power politics not just in the US the civil space programs around the world yep. you know legislators would say they're protecting jobs while directing billions of dollars to government contractors who expected to kick back some of those funds into the legislative campaign. And since getting millions in kickbacks requires building billions in spending, sp civil space budgets grew while civil space accomplishments left. I mean, it's literally true to say that we're flying around in circles waiting for shuttles to fall out of the sky. That's precisely what we were doing. That was the program in the 1980s. And it was successful in serving some interests well, but not on serving the interests of the companies right. and legislators who were playing that game so out of curiosity all right so back at that time oh, this is good did you envision breaking somehow that reinforcement system or 
injecting a new a new point in that system that would provide more capability. I, I, I don't want to speak for the others, but I okay, no, felt please. that was false. I, I don't feel that way today. But at the time, I felt that breaking the the, the fork cycle was right. beyond our capacity. And and the reason we achieved so much by changing the conversation about space is we did it in ways that created room for new space to rise and grow while leaving plenty of room for the forkers to get what they want. And okay, then, say more about that. What I wanted to do is kind of change the fork to program ratio. At the time, it was almost all pork and almost no program. Today, there's a little bit of program mixed in with the fork. This is a big achievement. Okay, it's much better than before, but it's still mostly pork. And the challenge before us is to figure out how to get a civil space program, again, not just in the U.S., that are more programmed than pork. And that's a huge challenge, and that's what sits in front of us now. When that debate, so we've gone through your Wednesdays on the Intrepid, and you're kind of formulating what are the things that changing the conversation sort of thing, it seemed like you had a focus on penetrating media coverage of space. Is that? Yes. We accurate? Okay. We, we quickly realized that the media was our friend, that we had a message that they generally wanted to hear, and and that resonated with, with lots of people who were interested in space. You know, it was a problem that didn't resonate outside the space community, but that's okay. I mean, because we were trying to change the conversation within the space community to create room within what we ultimately came to call new space. And, you know, we started doing a, a petition drive, you know, return to the moon, this time we stay. We did a lot of, of radio that, talk that shows. Might, that might actually be happening here in a few years, right? So that going to the moon to stay maybe but you were trying to find stuff that was going to hit a little bit faster than um four decades well we were trying to change minds we were really trying <laughs> to get a, we didn't really think we'd get a program to return to the moon in any meaningful time i am personally i'm not that interested in going to the moon or to mars and i don't really see the point of it um but personally it, like it, corporately it, yourself it's very useful. Or when you, when you say you're not not interested like from a business perspective not interest or just like corporally you don't need to be put in boots. Yeah, I don't need to be. I'm not interested in going into space. I also, I, I, I question, one of the things I question about the way we talk about space is that we just assume that the taxpayer should be paying for this. And it's not clear to me that there's any benefit to the taxpayer for going to Mars and, and Luna. Luna and Mars do not seem to have much of a payback as far as taxpayer is concerned. I understand why Elon wants to go die on the moon, not on impact. I get that, but he should pay his own way. I don't know why he thinks that the government should help pay for it. To me, that's a mystery. And if you can't give, and the community can't convince me, how are you going to convince people who are just opposed to technology and science? I just don't see the public purpose. And I think that when you take money from people by force or the threat of force, they ought to, they ought to get something back for it. And like many of our tax dollars, this is when it got anything back, just spend it. More than just Velcro and Tang. Neither Velcro or Tang actually came from a space program. So there's two lies. <laughs> we, we're not, we're not going to sell space selling spin-offs that actually weren't spin-offs, and because after all, other types of science has much more in the way of spin-offs. Space technology has a bad history of spin-offs. If spin-offs is your best argument, you have no argument. But do you think most people think then or now that way? I think very few people care about space. Probably a they maybe, care? A, maybe a tenth of the population okay. cares about space. And what troubles me is that I talk to people all the time who are big supporters of the militaries and have no idea that their military is completely dependent on assets in space. I talk to environmentalists all the time who have no idea that all the data we have on the planet comes from space. It's not that we couldn't collect it on the Earth. We could. It would just cost a lot more money and be much, much lower quality data. We're going to have any hope of understanding the planet Earth. We need space assets. If we're going to have any any hope of not losing the next wars, we need space assets. One of my favorite questions I love to ask of, of military types is, you know, imagine you were a, um, a first lieutenant with a platoon in South Vietnam, and suddenly there's no satellites. What's your situation? So, and they'll tell you, oh well, we, you know, we don't know where we are. You know, we're supposed to have paper maps. We've never practiced with them. If we have them, we have no secure communications. You know, we can use our cell phones and cell phone towers out there. And then they'll say, you know, and it'll be a few days before the, before there are new satellites up. And they say, no, they're wrong. It'll be a lot more than a few days before new satellites are up. 
Oh, and they can take those out easily too. And they so, don't know that. I mean, they totally don't know that. Really? You, so the interesting. Because I mean, know, again, they, they're not in the space command. They're you know army right. or air force, right. Enough, right? The space command knows that. The military is very compartmentalized. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. I so assume people, you know, generals know that. I assume. And some folks that are tasked with finding solutions may know it, but the the regular folk in the bulk of the organization maybe are not aware. Like maybe, how many may, people may are not aware? Be aware. This is a space device. Yes. A good chunk of its functionality comes, and that's just a regular cell phone, because of the GPS. But people don't think of it as a space device, and so therefore maybe don't place a whole lot of value on space. Let me challenge that people don't care about space. You can buy, I see NASA meatball t-shirts everywhere. And I don't know if that's just because I'm in the industry but it seems to be the sort of thing you can buy at Target and Walmart. Like there is a lot of enthusiasm enthusiasm for space. NASA has a great brand, yeah. but it's a okay. brand, it's a brand that's about history. It's a brand that's about history. It's a brand that's about Apollo. Mm -hmm. The NASA brand is tied to the past. Yes, I mean it's not about the future. I, I, it's I, I, in your background. I, I, this is a better background, more current. <laughs> I've got that's oh, a there's, a, picture. <laughs> there's a Maston vehicle picture over. Yeah, oh, I see the Maston vehicle up there. <laughs> but uh, all right, you're looking at this system, and you need to you need to change the conversation. And you you realize that the petitions thing isn't necessarily the way to go. How did you come to the conclusion of being a media influencer decades before? influencer was a job <laughs> you use the tools that are available and the tools that were available to us were fax machines and and lists of media outlets i would create these one-page faxes saying we're offering a speaker and then rick would go talk on these radio shows for three or five minutes and we did a lot of them and eventually I got volunteers to feed the fax machine and then a few years later, I got a modem that was a fax machine. Boy, was that an upgrade. Send a bunch of it once. You know, use the tools that you have, and the tools we have are fax machines and telephones. Was your approach at the time a an expert or a divergent opinion? Like, were you trying to create controversy we by offering? With both, and okay. we did much better with creating controversy. Looking for, we got the most attention. We, we looked for a hook that we could say something outrageous about. And you know, Scuttle the Shuttle is being a perfect example. You know, within yeah. months of us writing a press release saying you Scuttle the Shuttle, the phrase Scuttle the Shuttle was on the front page of The Economist. And in a year after that, the shuttle was scuttled. Well, these things announced it was um, and, and did that destroy your career? Did that destroy your your business? No. I'm like, a, no, I'm a real estate business. <laughs> it didn't yeah. affect shopping centers at all. And it didn't affect the foundation right. much one way or the other. Our donors didn't seem to care. The volunteers didn't seem to care. Nobody seemed to care much. There were volunteers at the time, I mean, donors at the time who gave anonymously because they were afraid that they'd be pushed back. I'm not aware of anybody who had much pushback in their careers. And a number of people, as you know, a number of people inside the agency in the U.S. were very supportive. Yes. And not so much in the other space. And this, by the way, is one of those, one of the evolutions of the entire industry, which is largely thanks to the work that you were doing, is you know, there are now other companies and other approaches from, you know, differing from the, that local maxima that had been reached of large aerospace companies. There's now this new local, higher local maxima that we were settling in, but now there's something to lose, right? There are there are companies, there are people that have jobs that have livelihood in that. And so one of the challenges is trying to figure out, are there repercussions? And you're saying at the time, you were not personally worried about repercussions, about kicking up antibodies, and that the organization wasn't really concerned about it either no no were our donors i mean our, you know our okay. donors included people who were very tied to the old system they want to change you know they saw that they were flying around in circles going nowhere so the the emperor had no clothes but you were the only ones that wanted to say it a lot of people wanted to say it a lot of people just nah. didn't know how to say it. they didn't have the tools they, okay. they didn't have the skills to say it effectively okay. You know, most of the people I talked to when I, I spent all those Wednesdays making phone calls were a remarkably inarticulate group of people. I understood what they were talking about. We're not going to put them in front of a camera and let them talk to the media. 
I was obviously it was obviously a big problem. We were very, we were a very dorky group of people, and we were geeks and proud of it. Long right, before so, it was popular. I forget when Revenge of the Nerds came out, but um, it used to be in the eighties that the nerds and the geeks were not at the top no, of the social media. No, not. That comes later. That's a different. That's a whole different thing. So, all right. So you you you're out there stirring things up, sending Reverend Rick out to go preach. It's been a couple of years now. Your colleague Lori is running NSS, and you like, hey, great, you can go do that. I'm going to create a splinter group. So fine, go do that. Um, but but there still is a community of like-minded individuals, even if you disagree. So like, besides your other co-founders, can you describe what the community of people that you were working with and sometimes working against were like? Well, the early advocates overwhelmingly came from Space Studies Institute, um, which had a, a senior associate program that's very similar to the advocates. I think I called up every senior associate. If I left any out, it was by mistake. We also would go to NSS conference and recruit people at the NSS conferences, usually the people who were upset, angry, and disheartened, you know, Apollo's children, which of course made the organization edgier and edgier as, as we grew, you know, expect an organization to moderate as it grows, but the opposite happened with us early on. Intentionally okay. organized as a guerrilla band because everybody was part-time. And so we form a, you know, a group to do a press release and it was just a one-off group. You know, these three or four people are going to do produce the press release, and we give them the authority to, to do it, which is kind of a scary thing to do because they might choose to do something weird. And they did sometimes, but we just lived with it. And it was quite some time before we started attracting advocates who wanted to moderate uh, what we were saying. We, the three of us, were very conscious of how we delivered our message. You know, we always wear suits. And I, I kept my hair short at the time, but I was, I was in business. I had to keep my hair short anyway. But we didn't moderate the message. We, mo we moderated the delivery. And okay. we were careful in the, in the way we spoke and the way we wrote. We, we, you know, I, I went back and looked at some of our early press releases. I'm still impressed with what a good job we did finding that balance between being negative, negative enough to get attention but not being so negative that, you know, that, that, that people see it as dishonest or you know, over the top. Say some more about that, because there are plenty of people in this industry today that see problems with the way of the world. They may be angry. If you're talking to some of these people that are today angry that the world's not better, how would you coach that appropriate moderation. See, I already mentioned I've lost interest in talking to the space aware and the space in, within the space community. I mean, obviously, we need to keep talking about ourselves, but we really need to start reaching out beyond that community. And I think there are three very basic problems with the way we talk about space, all of which come from the fact that we spend most of our time talking to each other. First, which I've mentioned, is we're a community that's comfortable with the language of math, science, and engineering. Yep. The vast majority of decisions you make as in our society are not coupled with mass science and engineering and can be very vocal about it. Uh, secondly, we wrongly assume that the things we find compelling about opening the space frontier, other people also find compelling. Those people in our community want to go. I don't want to go I'm an outdoor person. The idea of living in a can is offensive to me. But uh, maybe when we build space colonies, I don't want to go. 10 million types of space, <laughs> big ones. Because I want to try yeah. If I go to a conference for two days, <laughs> I'm unhappy because I don't get outside. And the third thing we do wrong is we advocate for space. Now, I know this is strange coming from somebody who spent the last 45 years advocating. We should do a lot less advocating. We'd be much more successful if we did more education and less advocacy. Because the truth is that what we really have to sell, what we're really doing in space, is popular theory. They just don't know we're really doing it. Even when they support the things that we're doing, they often oppose the way we're doing them. You know, a lot of people tell you they think it's a good idea to provide broadband to rural places in poor parts of the world. But then they'll turn around and tell you how much they hate all those satellites cluttering up the, uh, in the space. In my view, what we need to do is three things. We need to use ordinary language. We need to figure out who our target audience is before we talk to them, what they're interested in. And we have to restrain our advocacy tendencies and focus on facts that matter to the world. Yeah. And, and you put all of that under the umbrella of because we talk to ourselves. It all arises right. because it's so much so gratifying to talk to ourselves. 
you know, oh, we God. all love because... going to these conferences, right? And the reason we love going to the conferences is so we get to talk to other people enthusiastic about the same things we're enthusiastic about. That doesn't work when talking to other people. Right. It's, it is great and it is important and it is, I would think, necessary. I mean, you stopped talking about space to your non-space people because they just didn't get it. They weren't listening. It, now I can get so people listening. So you've changed enough of the conversation, but that same feeling that someone else may have of, I really am excited about this space thing, but I can't, Thanksgiving dinner is never focused on the right things because they want to talk about space, but they're talking about it in a... 1950s mindset rather than the you know what we're doing today and so well actually I think, you know, that I is, think problem, problem yeah. with what we're doing today is what we're doing is our civil space programs have have are not doing anything that matters to people they actually are doing some things that matter to people they are doing the environmental monitoring but that's a pretty small part of the budget very few people that i, I i've seen no contrary evidence that, that this that there's just not that many people that care about going on mars so let's, i mean in our community on, everybody's you. agreed that that's what we're going to do but the rest of the world is saying okay that's what they're doing but why are we paying for it? all right so your three things were let's let's hit them again because i want to i want to pick at this and i want to kind of connect it back to maybe what you did in the 80s and 90s um so it was not being too technical uh, the second one was making sure you're also focusing on what the audience. benefits are to the audience. And educate, third one, educate rather than advocate. Educate. Okay, good. All right. Ordinary language. Hold on. Are you familiar with XKCD? This is a web comic. He did a, several years ago, did a humorous explanation of the Saturn V, which he called the Upgoer Five. He used only common words to describe how the Saturn rocket works. So, I'm right, looking so here on my got, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, I love, and KCD is, I believe the, the author Randall worked at NASA for some time. And so he's got the technical, but he also can talk to a general audience. Okay, so this we need to put him in charge. a different mistake, which is talking about a how rather mm -hmm. than the who, what, and why. Because most Fair people enough. are much more interested in who, what, and why than they are in how. Our community is more interested in how than anything else. Did you find then or now that because our space colleagues sometimes feel isolated, that they the, the draw of having communal language that is a gatekeeper, some of it is because we might think that way, but some of it might be because that helps differentiate those of us who are in space from those people who are not. Absolutely. When talking amongst ourselves, we casually use all kinds of references from technology and from science fiction as well. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a community where I have no trouble using a word like rock, right? Everyone knows what it means. I don't even know what's in the dictionary. My guess is it's not. Because most people use the word of rock and they look at you like, what? It comes from stranger, I think. I don't know where it comes from. It comes from some science fiction novel. When we named the foundation, the foundation, everybody in the community knew it was an asthma reference. Nobody outside the community knew that. We thought this was obvious. They thought it was obscure. Uh, <laughs> and they just, the just in case, those who might be watching this that don't know what that reference is, mention who Isaac Asimov is. Well, Asimov is obviously very influential to our community. Uh, Rick and I actually had dinner with him one time. Um, with him, Jerry O'Neill, and a few other people. <laughs> it was really quite a great, it was great dinner. And okay. so the foundation, the book series, there's multiple books in it. There is a, I forget which streaming service has done a interpretation of that, but yeah. Oh, so really? I didn't know that. It's a, it's a, we'll call it an interpretation. Save that for a different discussion. But so steeped in language, that is a way for us to, us in the industry to feel a sense of belonging in a world where a lot of people don't see the benefits that we see. Is that as yeah. true now as it was then? Oh, more so because the language it, it has become more involved. So one of the things that people tell you is you can't explain the rocket equation without math, okay? I'll tell you how. I can believe that. So at the front of every atlas, yes. or the back of yep. every, or the back of every atlas. Remember atlases? Yep. Books I do. with paper maps for, for the younger audience. This is one of these nice charts that tells the distance between two places, and this is very useful on it because 
there's a very good correlation between the highway distance and how long it's going to take. Pretty good idea how much gas you're going to have to put in the car. You have um, a pretty good idea how many nights you're going to have to stay on the road. And you, you know, figure it through all that stuff out just by looking at a simple chart like that. And that doesn't work for specs. The, all those things disconnect. And, and then, you know, you can explain to somebody about something like Delta B without wading into the rocket equipment. They say it's disconnected. Yeah. It's not like it is on Earth. And they don't really need to know much more than that. And they can understand, you know, when you explain to them that the moons are, that it takes less fuel to get from orbit to the moons of Mars than it does and back, than it does to get from orbit to the first moon, Luna and back. I mean, that makes no sense, of course, <laughs> but it's a fact. And you can explain that these, these disconnects exist. You can explain to them about, like, about the importance of latency. We measure distance around the solar system in light minutes and light seconds because it's important. People who, you know, we don't care how many kilometers away it is. We care very much what the latency is when we, want to, when we want to control our machinery that's someplace far away. A latency of a few seconds, people can understand that that's not going to work for, for a gamer. And a latency of a few minutes is not going to work for a conversation. No. Um, they don't need to understand any of the math that goes around that goes with all that. You can explain these things in simple language. I, I call all this syllabic, by the way. I decided it's really just the geography of the solar system. Geography, ah, you can think of as the relationship so between civilization okay. and its physical environment. All right. And syllabography is the relationship between civilization and the rest of the solar system. I made it all right. so when we, because um, geography of the solar system seems off. The New York City subway map, if you were to layer it over top of where the actual tracks are, You're right. it's it is completely near. inaccurate. No, it's completely inaccurate. So from a technical standpoint, it is useless, and you should never be using <laughs> the subway map if you are trying to lay track, And but it is a, it's the interpretation of it, the thing that matters to the audience. So a few, a few let's, let's ago, to talk yeah, about this. The Museum of Modern Art took the original drawing of the subway map and put it on the wall for everyone to see as if it was a work of art because it really is a work of art not a map so we need we need to have language what is your observation about how we talk to this broader audience we need to get okay so we're gonna in this future state we're gonna have better language and we'll be able to get outside of the the bubble but as we speak to a broader audience besides language what is the thing that you found was important then, you'd also think we should be doing now, talking to this broader well, audience. Then I would say that we were pretty much ineffective at talking to people's audience, that they just changed the channel, they walked away, and that we ended up only talking to the space community, which was, what, which was really the task that was at hand, because we wanted, at, at the time, the, the civil space program worked actively against private space efforts, we need to change the conversation within the space community so we can allow room for new space to, to be birthed and grow. Up. Now that we've done that, I think it's now it, we can, it makes sense to try and talk to the broader community. And, and ultimately, what you want to achieve is, is changing what's politically viable. So right now, it's politically viable to use NASA for pork because nobody really cares that much. If enough people start caring about the results that you're getting, then maybe you can have a better discussion about things like prizes and, and data purchases and so forth. Things that we long know would be dramatically more effective and would advance things, you know, way quicker than we're trying to advance. I mean, yeah. you know, really, it, if there was a prize to put people on the moon for five years, it would happen almost right away. It's not really that hard to do compared to the amount of money that we're spending. Um, True. We're spending tens of billions of dollars to do something that a billion dollar prize could make happen. But and the Google Lunar X Prize didn't put a robot on the moon. Lunar X Prize wasn't enough money and it didn't last long. I'd agree with both. But if I was designing a prize program for government, they would take the, they would just they would spend the money, they put it in an escrow account because nobody believes the government will actually meet their obligations. And and every year they'd add they'd add to the escrow account until okay. somebody until somebody does it. So eventually it reaches the number that somebody will do it at. And you also need to lottery, you provide money for yeah. second and third prizes too, because you don't want to win take all situation. Okay. Prizes can be well designed. And there's every we know that multi-million dollar prizes work for small things. And there's every reason to believe that multi-billion dollar prizes work for big things. If I thought flags and footprints on Mars was important, then I'd say, well, we should just have a prize for flags and footprints on Mars and someone will do it. Someone will go do it. The 
Someone's kind of doing it. Isn't SpaceX doing that? Sort of, kind of, eventually. Talk to me about speaking to a broader broader audience. So back then, you needed to talk to the space. You needed to change the conversation in the industry about space. Right. Now, we need to change the con. You think one of the, the challenges ahead of, I don't know if it's the industry or the society or the species, but is to change the conversation about the benefits of space? Well, like what I think it's part of a broader, we need to bring space into the broader conversation that, that's already ongoing about how we survive. It's okay. existential. It's, it's clearly existential. I mean, the, the, okay. you know, the existential problem of the 21st century is that we have the ability to destroy our planet and destroy ourselves. And are right. we going to survive? You know, so far we've managed to avoid having a biological or nuclear war. Okay, we need we need to keep that up. We've also, but we haven't done so well with preserving the environment. We're fouling the air, misusing the land, and abusing the oceans on a massive scale. Uh, there's a lot of focus on climate change these days. That's a good thing, but climate change is a small part of the problem. The you really need to address the larger problem, which is how do we live with so many people on this planet and manage it effectively. The way we, we put it in the Foundation Credo is we want to use the nearly unlimited resource of the solar system to create a future that's free or fair and more prosperous. I mean, those aren't the exact words, but Amen. The, no, it's you know, to me, that's a goal. If that were NASA's goal, it would deserve much more public support than it gets now. But if you actually yeah. look at the NASA Act, you'll see that that's not NASA's goal. No. There's a long list of goals, none of which much of anybody cares about. Few of which anyone knows are NASA goals, including including people at NASA and including Congress. Because I mean, the NASA yeah. Act is way under read. People read it, they say, ah, we're not supposed to be doing that. <laughs> You're adding to my reading list. I don't know the last time <laughs> yeah, I yeah. read the other. But um, not, it's been modified right, so, several times, but they just keep adding new goals. They never get rid of the old ones. Yeah. And yes, it's if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. And talk to me about this last of your three things, which is less advocacy, more education. I'm not convinced of this one, so convince me that I I want to be clear that I think that it makes sense to scream as loudly as possible about pork within space in the space field because it attracts attention outside the space. Okay. Field. And I know it upsets people within the space community, but I think it makes sense to do it because it attracts attention outside the space community. Okay. I, I, as you know, I, I think we should be attacking the SOS. Well, maybe not every day, but <laughs> every other day. It's it's a ridiculous program. It's you know it's ridiculous on the face that people can see that it's ridiculous. It's a great way to attract attention. But once you attract their attention, you, you need to convey a, a, a message that they care about. And, and depending on the audience, I think the messages that work best are the environmental message and the military message. I think that very few people, including those who are into the military, are aware of what the military is doing in space. If they know that there's a space force, it's only because it's a joke. I mean, the idiots who named it the space force obviously don't care that it's a joke. <laughs> no, I don't know. But, and, and of course, the environmental angle, which a lot of people care about. There's a, a truly wonderful satellite that the Brits just put up that's measuring the energy leaking out of every house in the UK. And that's pretty cool. Something that people can understand. They can understand that that's some, that's data that's pretty hard to get from the ground. We could do with drones, but it would take many years and cost a fortune. Yep. Yeah, they built a small satellite that's going to do every house in the UK in a couple of years. And we'll do them again. So, see yep. this All right, so in this world, do you really think there's people that don't know that space is out there? Like, I've, it seems to me like the appeal to education is shiny because people who love space love to talk about space and therefore they can say, oh, I'm educating kids. Is there a nuance to that education? What what is what is that education that you're talking about? Is it math and science education, no, or is I, it something I, else? I, I, listen, I, I certainly think we need to do better job in math and science education with kids. But with grown-ups, we're not we're not going to see that. You know, I, I, we, we bemoan scientific literacy as if it's necessary to function in, to be scientifically literate to function in society. Well, most of the people I know who function just fine in society don't have any scientific literacy at all. They know almost nothing about space and what, about science and technology and what little they think they know is wrong. The, and of course, there's a large minority in our society 
that is actively opposed to science and technology. And, and they make decisions too. And we, I think yep. we need to find ways of talking about space that finesses the, the need for science and technology completely. I think we also need to be, with kids, we really, it's a great way to get kids interested in science and technology. We do need to get more kids interested in science and technology. But yeah. We're never going to succeed in getting the majority interested. And if all of our space education is just about inside, if all of our education is routing more people into the bubble, then we fail in that getting it outside and, and conveying that message exactly. elsewhere. Well, that's why I created a, a, an area called solography, because now there's something that uh, that's not science. Right now, we teach about space in science class. So naturally, it's oriented mm -hmm. towards teaching kids about science. I, I, I met a calculus teacher who teaches in space. All the problems he used in his AP calculus class were for a, a fountain on a rotating space column. He spent the whole semester doing the fountain of the rotating space column <laughs> and did integral and derivatives. You know, kids learn how to make how to build, how to design a fountain on a rotating space column. That's kind of cool. It is kind of cool, but also sort of trivial. <laughs> I mean, I guess better than you know learning it by following the track for cannonball. I you know, but yeah. you, I've never actually seen a cannonball fly. I've seen cannons blown up, but not with balls in them. So. I think the only ones would have been Wiley e. Coyote and I, I mean, do not trust the physics. But you know, we still use uh, Isaac Newton's cannonball because we've been using it ever since Isaac Newton's time. And it's you know, it's on a tower. It's a cannonball on a tower. Because that's what Isaac Newton threw a picture of. A cannonball on a tower. And we all still use a cannonball on a tower. Be careful what might stick. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> I mean, it's not complaining. But I think that what if you start talking about zoography and the same we talk about geography. You can start teaching people basic facts about the solar system that matter to them. I mean, does a person really need to know any math or science to know the atmosphere has no top? A few hundred kilometers you're going to fall down in, in a week, and you know a couple hundred more you're going to fall down in a month. I mean, they don't need to know any math or science to know the, that the atmosphere gets just gets thinner and thinner. And thinner. You just need to talk. Yeah. Important. It's an important fact about. It's as important a fact about our civilization as you know the shape of our coastlines and stuff. There's a lot of stuff floating around through the upper atmosphere, very high upper atmosphere, that needs to get reboosted all the time. I, I've been reading stuff greatly about debris. Average science writer writing about debris doesn't know that stuff at 200 kilometers is going to fall down on its own. They don't know that um, because, well, you know, they went to journalism school. Right. You know, they didn't study science. And and if you start out the conversation with a formula with the little curly brackets and all that stuff, then you, you, you lose. Them before you start. I, I tried to explain the rocket equation to many people over the years, and I always fail. But when I switched to showing that little chart, they said, oh, okay, I get it. Bob, I really appreciate all the work back then and all of the time now. In, in rounding this out, besides you know, a windowless room, do you have anything else that stands out like from a a personal challenge or a, a, something like what what did your time in the foundation do for you like what what was the bob coming out of that work versus the bob that started it a lot of things changed and you know many of my closest friends are from that community and so forth but i think the thing that was most impactful most quickly is that i became a much better man when you manage volunteers, you really need to get buy-in. And I carried that over into my business. It made me a much better manager. And I would argue a better person. The, you know, how much that translates into profits over the ensuing years, it's hard to say. But it certainly translated into a more gratifying work environment. And that's and that's a good thing. Amen. And and I'm happy, Amen. You know, and, I, and I would urge anybody who's in business to find a way to spend in one or two days a week working for a nonprofit because you learn so much in a nonprofit environment that you can't possibly learn running your own business. I, I will agree with that. Uh, Bob, is there anything that I, the foundation, or anyone who's watching this can do for you? Because I appreciate the time, but I also want to make sure that you know we're thinking of things that you that would be beneficial for you. How can we return well, if, the if, favor? If, if any of your book agent or publisher Publish my book, <laughs> which I'm right. <laughs> I will add that I am not a book publisher, but I can send some faxes and maybe. Uh, <laughs> I got anybody seen faxes anymore? 
Bob, thank you very much for the time, for the reminiscing, for the personal insights. Um, greatly appreciate it. And best of luck in, the, in whatever the next uh, part of the endeavor is. And, and thank you for uh, taking on the foundation because I don't want to do it anymore. My pleasure to serve. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Bob. Well, that was pretty great, right? I know. I, as I keep saying, I keep learning more things each time uh, I have one of these conversations, and I love listening to it again. Uh, I can pick up more <laughs> more pieces there. So, um, just in case there was any confusion. Bob Ross and Bob Werb are two different people, even though his hair is kind of gone that direction. And yes, I did steal that joke from you. <laughs> so. Yeah. But no, it's it's cool because you know, Bob, by the time I got involved in the industry, Bob wasn't at nearly as present as um, you know, Jim and Rick were as the three founders. Like I knew of him by his reputation but I didn't have as much time to interact with him, which, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I've known of him for nearly 20 years, but I've not just sat down and hung out with him or talked to him. Uh, uh, he's He was really helpful to the Center for Space, Commerce, and Finance, which I'm on the board of. Uh, he, you know, graciously writes checks on a pretty frequent basis once a year for that. So that's really nice to see. Uh, but no, most of most of the stories that we just heard were absolutely new to me and, and really, really interesting. Um, I do want to point out in the chat, um, Al Differ, Jeffrey Mamber, uh, somebody else, somebody else. Um, I lost it, Drat. Uh, Joe Burris, um, all of you folks yeah. really appreciate that you're here. This part is live, so thanks very much. Uh, for the, uh, the, the Space Frontier Foundation's uh, Pioneers of Space Commercialization series, what we're doing is we're uh, capturing those prior, right, um, sometimes days, sometimes weeks in advance, editing them, bringing them uh, bringing them the, them to you as a recording. Uh, so sorry if that was uh, misleading or, or confusing, uh, but we will. Sean assures me that he will pass your your hellos and highs on to uh, on to work. So uh, it was great. So Sean, what were some of your takeaways there? I know you were taking notes during the interview originally. Now you've heard it again. Um, uh, what, what were some things that would surprise you? There were a few things that surprised me. The, uh, it's not that crazy to just say, we just picked up the phone or, you know, that's for all the highfalutin crazy technology rocket, blah, blah, blah. It boiled down to picking up the phone and talking to yeah. people. Um, and while I do think that the times, you know, the world has moved on in no small part because of the work that Bob mm -hmm. and all the other folks who we're going to be talking to have done, that talking to people outside the space family or the space bubble um, really resonates. Um, and so as we're thinking about what we should be doing next, that's a big part of it. I don't think we're going to use fax machines, but <laughs> you know, I, I've taken some inspiration from that. There are, I have a pretty broad range of interests and I have started anytime I hear something that seems to be a, um, an intellectual, someone who can actually, who's actually thinking deeply about an issue, whether it's a podcast or an article or someone on the street, doesn't matter. I take that as an opportunity to reach out and say, Hey, I appreciate the you know the perspective you were offering in this. Um, do you have any thoughts about how that topic 
would apply to space right. because I'm part of the space group. And then I think there, there's some things there. And so I've started doing that in my regular day to day. And I've had some really interesting conversations and, and have helped take space beyond the, the, the tribe. Uh, so that's one of the things that even if I don't necessarily want to pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I liked, um, you said the phrase uh, facts that speak to the target audience. Well, first of all, yeah. identifying the target audience is maybe uh, a trick all by itself, but then yeah. um, educate instead of advocate, right? Those two things kind of go side by side with each other. Uh, you know, there's there's some lessons to learn from the guys who are here first, building the foundation, um, both the foundation that we're a part of, but also the foundation of this, you know, this commercialization of space across not just the United States, but now that model has moved around the world as well, right? And and yeah. somebody has to be that that first snowflake that becomes a snowball, that becomes an avalanche that moves the mountain. Um, and and to talk to folks like Werb, who are actually the people doing it, uh, I think it's I think it's uh, pretty amazing. And, and this is um, this is not something that is brand new to space. I mean, um, part of my my first career was is someone who could translate between the the geeks in the computer lab and the business people who were trying to figure out what to do with this whole web right. thing right. right like it was translating between and it was about knowing and it's not it is not saying a different story it is figuring out the parts of the value that matter to different people right so it's some people think oh well you should say the same thing to everyone because that way you're you're not you know spinning something or equivocating but no, there's yeah. a difference there. Like, know who your audience is and figure out how to, to best present to them. And that was one of the things, you know, Laurie talked about her ability to be in the room and not stand out as one of those people, uh, right? Like, you, you mean Laurie that, Garver, Deputy Administrator of NASA, who was on our first program last week that yes. everybody else should watch? Yes. If you haven't already, first read the book then watch the thing. Um, but yeah, she talked about the fact that she was able to speak for this commercial space idea, but in a way that didn't immediately trigger some of the antibodies. Now she absolutely triggered yeah, yeah. them <laughs> uh, and how, but you know, that figuring out a way to make sure that the conversation gets started is, is really important um and i'm still figuring out how the various pieces manage to to get in the position that they are in order for us to enjoy the 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 world that we right. have that we live in right. today well and so. then again for the folks that are tuning in for the first time the point of this series is to take a look at the past this is the 35th anniversary of the space frontier foundation um, Y'all, before I was there, when Word was there, Monthly and Tomlinson and Garver and, and, and uh, Spawnable and like all of these people, right? Uh, Mamber we talked to today. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate that one. Um, you know, all of these folks were in a completely different world. And, and I've been at it 20 years. You've been at it, I think, 15 years-ish. Um, yep. And you know, we think we know stuff, but we definitely don't know this stuff. So uh, I, I have yeah. really enjoyed this. But what it's not just about looking backwards, right? The point of this is to figure out what lens did they use to make the decisions that they used that they made at the time, and then bring that lens to the 21st century and say, okay, this is our last 35 years. What's our next 35 years? 
right? And that's yeah, that's we, everything, everything. We're not done. No, no, I know that. I know that. We're not done. Absolutely. <laughs> and so whenever I'm doing these interviews, I'm listening for what tomorrow sounds like, right? Uh, yeah. what, what is the lens uh, that we can see tomorrow through? So that's what I've been really paying attention to. And it, and it, and it may mean some of the things might be the same battles. I mean, we, we, we don't have a shuttle program to worry about, right. but we also don't yet have the manifestation of commercial space stations. We're getting there. But so like some some things have changed and others still need to change um, and some tactics and approaches. It's important to know how they decided. Like so asking, um, you know, when I asked uh, Bob, like, did that affect your career? Right. And he's like, no, I wasn't. That wasn't my career. Right. right? But it's, you know. Do is that the same thing that we're going to have now are the people as we're advocating for the next sort of change do we do we care do we do we want to have anonymous donors or have we gotten past the point where you have to be like really careful about it and now we need to say okay these are some, these are difficult conversations that we're going to have but we can be be present and not have to like worry about uh, whether or not it's going to end a contract that we have or something like that. So it's, it's a, it is a complex uh, question that we get to deal with. So um, did you have anything in particular that really stood out to you as you were, you know, do it again? Um, yeah. Cause I'm on the inside of this. Uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a, uh, an old science fiction fan um, in my different office. This, this is not my normal office. Um, uh, just shelves and shelves and shelves of old science fiction, Heinlein, Asimov, Clark, everybody. Um, and so, yeah, we can use a phrase like grok in our, in our language and it's not weird, right? It's a, it's a little weird. It's a little weird because you're, you're virtue signaling. I'm a nerd, you're a nerd, and we both speak nerd language, right? Um, I want to I want to point something out in the chat. So Al Differ just points something that I had not seen before. He's like, uh, the reason some of our conferences were in Los Angeles was about reaching a particular target audience, Hollywood. You know, I have gone to many of the LA events, San Francisco events. Uh, that I never I never got that conclusion. So that's actually right goes right back to the facts to speak to the target audience i didn't ever clue in that we were in la to speak to hollywood although i do remember once that lance bass from nsync came to one of the uh space hmm. frontier foundation meetings so so that worked okay. i just never connected those two things yeah and i know uh as i became involved the you know, at the San Jose Double Tree, that was there because it was in the Bay Area. It was Silicon right. Valley. It was in, intentionally there so that by the, by that point, where the focus was commercial space and trying to make sure that there was, we were tapping the the organization focus was focused on fostering space companies and the startup community in general. And the investor community, broadly speaking, based there uh, was part of the reason. So, um, but I guess some of that does get lost. Even even if it is said at the beginning of the conference, uh, it's not something that people necessarily remember over time. And it's it's helpful for us, anyone who's going to be taking an active role now. Keep in mind, these are some, like what are the things that we've learned before? Um, you know, which parts should should what we're singing now be the same melody, and where should we make sure it's harmonizing uh, and and understanding that because that's that's important. Um, and the, the, this whole world is still complex. 
I don't think there's anyone that's coming out of out of school or out of like early career that's like, oh, I understand how this market works. <laughs> it's there's, there's not, it's still not we're not, not there. there, not there. Nope. There, I remember one of the earliest space investment summits slash um, boot camps. Uh, we held it at, at uh, I think it was NASA Ames. I think it was at NASA Ames Research Center, uh, specifically to start to engage the investor community. So, all right, like let's think about who our target audiences are. What messages do we want to convey to them? Um, Sean, it has come to a close. Is there anything that you would like to say? Um, next guest, next event, uh, some, yeah. um, uh, updates. So next week we have a conversation with Jeff Krukin, uh, who um, has a different. So he's not the founder, but he is someone that has his story fits inside of the same sort of era that we're looking at. Um, and I think we get some real good personal insights yeah. into his journey and its ups and downs uh, that I I think people are going to really be interested to hear and may draw comfort from understanding the trials that he went through and the trials we might be going through ourselves today. So check okay. that out. All right. Thanks a lot. Sean Mahoney, executive director of the Space Frontier Foundation. Thanks a lot, sir. Appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Pleasure. Thanks, everybody.